From scavenging to being a central player in a genocidal machine, Heinrich Himmler's life has been the subject of study for decades. In this video, we want to analyze some of the most striking aspects of the last years of the Nazi leader, from the confessions he made to his therapist, which included Hitler's illnesses and ethnic origin, to the mystical delusions that led him to search for magical items. From order to madness, from obedience to betrayal, these were the last years of the Nazi leader. The final period in Heinrich Himmler's life was marked by madness, obsession, and physical pain. Since he was a child, the main person in charge of the SS suffered from serious stomach problems. A heavy meal could put him in bed for days. Already in times of the Third Reich, Himmler resorted to the help of the physiotherapist Felix Kirsten, who prescribed drugs that calmed the pain. This was the key to the trust and macabre mind of the Nazi hierarch. For several years, Himmler used him as a confidant, and thanks to Kirsten's testimony, Today we know some of the leader's most controversial secrets. Kirsten's memoirs account for Himmler's aversion to Jews, which was inculcated from a young age by books such as Henry Ford's The International Jew and The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. He claimed that the Jews must be annihilated in their entirety. However, it was not until 1942 that Kirsten heard of the death camps. It was in a casual chat, and to find out more about it, the therapist asked how things were going there. Himmler replied, too bad, lately there are only Jews with good teeth, so there is not much to get. A few months ago we received many from Holland, Belgium and France, from their heads we were able to extract large amounts of gold. This scared the doctor, who over the next few years subtly tried to convince Himmler to wind down the extermination of Jews. In fact, it is speculated that it was Kirsten who convinced the leader to try to negotiate the release of prisoners with humanitarian organizations. We'll get to that chapter later. By 1942, Himmler was concerned that the Fuhrer's orders were no longer clear and precise, he was furious and his mind collapsed. The SS leader asked Kirsten to study the medical report of Hitler, who was suspected of having been ill with syphilis since the First World War. The therapist suggested that it would be best to put him in a mental hospital to treat nervous conditions, but Himmler replied that it was impossible, that he did not have the power to do it, and that, moreover, it could cause irreparable damage to the morale of the German soldiers. But the biggest surprise Kirsten got was when Himmler assured him that the Fuhrer himself has Jewish blood, he feels stained. According to Kirsten, the Nazi leader warned him that it was the biggest secret of the Third Reich. Himmler detailed that both the maternal grandmother and the father of the Fuhrer were half-Jewish. The head of the SS assured that Hitler took care that nothing could be verified, modifying the official books and eliminating possible witnesses and relatives. Of course, the therapist's version is one of the strangest myths of World War II, and there is no confirmation other than his word. The doctor's records also documented the homophobic positions of Himmler, who advocated at all times for the repopulation of the planet with Aryan blood. This is really interesting, since Himmler himself defended chastity in his youth. As an adult, and with the power of a murderous empire, he had a wife and mistresses, and he severely questioned monogamy. The power gained by the SS, and Hitler's faith in him to orchestrate the final solution, made Himmler an eccentric who saw himself as a medieval emperor. He got carried away by his fascination with the occult arts and supported all kinds of crazy adventures like an expedition of Nazi scientists to Tibet to find the supposed mythological origins of the Aryan race. He was also obsessed with obtaining legendary treasures with supposed magical power, such as the Holy Grail, the Spear of Longinus, and, oddly enough, Thor's hammer itself. In recent years, his assistants questioned his logic and he seemed increasingly lost in his delusions of grandeur. He not only fantasized about mythical treasures, but he lived like a king, with great luxuries while his troops began to feel the lack of basic goods. His refuge in the world was the Wheelsburg Castle, which he purchased in 1934 and on which he spent 15 million marks, equivalent to nearly 8 million dollars, to make it the spiritual center of Nazism. As the war drew to a close, Himmler assured his men that he would take responsibility for the actions perpetrated by the SS. 
From early 1945, Himmler ordered a partial halt to the mass extermination of Jews, and even began negotiations with representatives of humanitarian organizations to exchange Jewish slaves for privileges for himself at the time of his trial. He also tried to negotiate with the British and Americans behind Hitler's back. He was convinced that, based on his image, a kind of transitional government could be created in Germany. The Allies knew that it was a matter of time to win the war, so they rejected the SS leader's proposal. The Führer eventually found out about this and ordered Himmler's apprehension. It was the beginning of the end. Cornered, one of the main responsible for the extermination of millions, he decided to flee. On May 10, 1945, after the capture of Berlin by the Soviets, Himmler left Flensburg with his trusted men. He was disguised as a sergeant of the Geheime Feldpolizei, the secret police of the Wehrmacht. On the 21st of that same month, the Allies captured him on a bridge between Hamburg and Bremen. He initially tried to hide behind his false identity, but the British managed to discover that he was none other than the leader of the SS. Since several high-ranking military and high-ranking Nazi officials and politicians had committed suicide upon arrest, they searched him and stripped him of his clothes. In them, they found vials of cyanide. They offered him the only available clothes they had, those of the English army, but Himmler did not accept and for long hours he stayed in his underwear and covered with a blanket, demanding to speak with General Eisenhower or with Churchill, he did not accept minor interlocutors. On May 23, 1945, he was transferred and his clothes were returned to him. A bodily orifice inspection was performed to ensure that he did not keep anything hidden in his body. The review was quick, until they reached the mouth. A crack of broken glass was heard, Himmler had bitten a cyanide capsule that he carried between his molars. The English tried to pump his stomach, but to no avail. To prevent his grave from becoming a Nazi pilgrimage site, the English authorities buried him in the area near his suicide in an unmarked grave, in a location never revealed. The young man who forged a path in the empire of terror rests in a nameless grave, and is remembered for his betrayals and delusions. To finish defining Himmler, we can resort to the words of Albert Speer, companion and minister of armaments of the Reich, he was half school teacher and half crazy. A combination of order, obsession and a total loss of sanity. Such were the last years of Heinrich Himmler. In the 1990s, a series of events linked to the Second World War caused an earthquake in Italian public opinion. In 1994, a group of journalists discovered that a former SS commander, Eric Prieb, had been enjoying a peaceful life in Argentina for almost 40 years, never having paid for his heinous crimes. From then on, Italian society demanded that the Nazi officer be extradited to his country, so that he could be tried according to the law. At the same time, the court summoned Karl Haas, a former spy for the Third Reich, who was now an 84-year-old man. Haas had been a collaborator of Priebs as well as one of the most unscrupulous members of Hitler's intelligence service and, in his most powerful years, was responsible for the deportation of hundreds of people to concentration camps. Haas was offered a highly convenient deal, he was to give away Priebs' identity and in exchange would receive legal immunity escaping conviction for his own crimes. The former spy accepted the deal and was taken into custody at a hotel in Rome, guarded by two police officers. However, one day before offering testimony on him, Hass had a change of heart, deciding that he would not say anything about Prieg. He waited until nightfall, when everyone was asleep, and went up to the first floor terrace to elope. He only had to find a way down to the street, and he would escape justice forever. Today, in this new episode of Military History, we'll tell you everything about the Nazi spy Karl Haas and his crimes. Are you ready? Let's get started! Karl Haas was born on October 5, 1912, in Kiel, northern Germany. In his youth, he was attracted by the ideals of Nazism and the possibilities of social advancement offered by Hitler's political movement. In 1934 he joined the SD, the fearsome intelligence service of the SS, 
and there he began a successful career in the world of espionage. At that time, the director of the SD was Reinhard Heydrich, one of the main German hierarchs, who established that the main objective of the organization should be to monitor each and every one of the inhabitants of the Third Reich. Hass immediately stood out among the other agents for his talent for deception and his ruthless methods, which earned him promotion to the rank of captain. In 1943, Nazi German troops occupied Italy, and this was the time when Karl Hass achieved his greatest share of power. His superiors assigned him the task of setting up a network of radio operators and spies with the mission of sabotaging the military operations that the Allies were carrying out in the country. At the same time, Hass collaborated closely with SS commander Herbert Kapler, whom he helped arrest Jewish residents of Italy. The spy was responsible for the capture of approximately 1,000 Jews, who were deported to the Auschwitz concentration camp. One of the most important operations led by Karl Haas was the arrest of Princess Mafalda of Savoy, the daughter of the Italian king Victor Emmanuel III. Adolf Hitler held an immense grudge against the princess, since he considered that she did everything possible to hinder the war effort against the Allies. In fact, he once referred to her as the scavenger bird of the royal family, an expression that was endorsed by Joseph Goebbels. In, in 1943, the hierarchs of the Third Reich ordered Haas to arrest her and send her to Germany. To fulfill his mission, the spy took advantage of an occasion in which Mafalda was traveling through Bulgaria. Haas contacted the princess and asked her to go urgently to the German embassy, since her husband had left her an important message. Mafalda fell into the trap, and as soon as she entered the building she was arrested on charges of subversive activities. Her final destination was the Buchenwald concentration camp, where she was severely wounded in an Allied bombing raid. The princess died when doctors tried to amputate an infected arm. Of all the crimes committed by Haas, the most aberrational was the massacre of the Ardeatine trenches, which occurred on March 24, 1944. The day before, a small group of partisans, enemies of fascism, had planted a bomb in the heart of Rome, in a barracks occupied by German military. The explosion claimed the lives of nearly 30 Burmak soldiers, while the perpetrators managed to flee without being caught. When Hitler learned of the attack he went mad with rage, and gave instructions for such bloody revenge that no other partisans would dare attack his men again. For every German murdered, 10 Italians were to be executed. The massacre was organized by the commander Herbert Kapler, who prepared a list with the names of 335 people to be eliminated, which were extracted from the Roman prisons. The condemned were Jews, political prisoners, and prisoners of war. Those in charge of carrying out the massacre were Karl Haas and the SS officer Eric Prieck, who led the sentence towards the Ardeatine pits, some abandoned mines on the outskirts of Rome. They were made to enter the caves in groups of five, and all of them were shot in the back of the head. Hass himself personally murdered two civilians. When the corpses finished piling up inside, they ordered to demolish the entrance to the mines, and leave the bodies sealed inside. When World War II ended, Hass was captured by the United States, but instead of being tried for his crimes, he was employed as a spy by the U.S. Army. The only officer sentenced for the massacre in the Ardeatine trenches was Herbert Kapler. In the 1990s, when Eric Prieb was found to be living quietly in Argentina, the Italian government ordered his extradition to stand trial for his role in the massacre. Karl Haas was summoned to testify against him and tell everything that had happened in the mines, in exchange for legal immunity. Although the ex-spy accepted the deal, for some unknown reason, one day before testifying, he repented and decided to escape from the hotel where he was being kept. At four in the morning he went to the terrace on the first floor and tried to go down through a window to the street. His advanced age worked against him, and he ended up falling from a high altitude. He broke his leg and pelvis, and was immediately found by security officers, who sent him to a hospital. Once hospitalized, Hass ended up testifying against Preek and confessing that he had also shot two people in the Ardeatine trenches. 
He tried to evade responsibility for him by claiming that he was only following orders, but the court considered that the excuse was invalid. Both Hass and Preet were sentenced to life imprisonment, although in consideration of their state of health, they were granted the benefit of house arrest. The ex-spy spent his last years of life in solitude, secluded in a house in Castel Gandolfo, near Rome. The few people who continued to visit him stated that he spoke little and never mentioned events from the past. His daily routine consisted of reading books, watching television, and taking a walk when he got permission. He passed away on April 21, 2004, at the age of 92. In this way the life of Karl Haas, one of the many war criminals of Nazi Germany, came to an end. Why do you think Karl Haas backed down at the last moment and tried to escape? Leave your answer in the comment box below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to learn about many more military events that left their mark on history.